Today we are uh, interviewing from here is Stantec, and um, take it away. You'll start with a, a brief presentation. So we're from Stantec. Um, in Boston, we have um, about 90 people in our office. There's two Boston offices of Stantec, so some of you may have heard of Stantec. Um, there's about 150 people in our architectural office in Boston. And in our Boston, in our group, um, we're in, a, we're in a, um, a group of 55 landscape architects and civil engineers. And within that, we have our sport group. And we're dedicated landscape architects and civil engineers. And that's all we do every day is, is sport projects. Um, and so we collaborate at, at every level. But within Stantec, we have all the other sort of architectural engineering services that um, would be needed on this project, um, with the exception of um, survey. And we'll talk a little bit more about the team at the end of this um, presentation. So. Um, we can deliver a project basically from beginning to end is, is sort of the, the short version of this slide. But, you know, we have experience in delivering sports projects, um, you know, leading you to the planning design, if that's all you need is sort of planning and estimating. We, you know, we can do, we do a lot of master planning, but we can bring the project right through, you know, construction, construction administration, management, you know, whatever, whatever you need. And, um, you know, it's, it's a high focus on the overall design of the project. Not just the sports component, not just the landscape, not just the civil engineering component, but the entire project. I mean, we really want it to be a successful project for you. We want others to see the project as successful and complete, not just a sports field project. And our relationships are extremely important to us. Um, we can tell you that probably uh, 55 to 60 percent of our work in 2016 will be repeat clients. Um, so, you know, we want to build a relationship with Hull, the town of Hull. We want to be there for your questions after the project is, is built and complete. If you have any questions or issues, we, we want to be there for you. Um, with, with synthetic turf, with track surfacing, with all the sort of athletic components, netting, goals, all that kind of stuff, it's, it's really important to be involved nationally. In, in the various organizations. Um, American Sports Builders is, is a big one, um, where all the, um, like I said, not, not it's, it's uh, primarily the, the contractors get certified um, in, in building either a certified track builder or a certified field builder, a certified tennis court builder, but then really the leading manufacturers of all those products are, um, are very active in that organization, and so, and so are we, and it's actually the um, organization that we look to to um, uh, basically um, review our projects. They give awards, things like that. So, you know, you might hear of you know AIA awards, architectural awards, and things like that. In in sports fields and track and field, it's the ASBA that that, that we look to. Um, the Synthetic Turf Council um, is really the voice of the synthetic turf industry. Um, so, the issues of of crumb rubber, I'm sure, are on your minds or on your questions. Um, the the um, Synthetic Turf Council is the first place to go for answers to those questions. I I'm, I'm, uh, serve on the board of directors at, at Synthetic Turf Council. So our, our level of involvement in these national organizations is you know, at a very high level. That's, that's the point we want to get across, very, very active nationally. So this is just a breakdown of um, the organizational Josh. chart. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm Josh Atkinson. And uh, so this is a uh, breakdown of the organizational chart that we'd be using, and David Nardoni is the principal in charge. I'd be the project manager. Um, just to give you guys a brief overview, David's been in the industry for about 20, 25 years or so. 20 years. <coughs> not to, not to sound too old. Uh, I've been in the industry for about 10 years. I'm a landscape architect. We're both registered landscape architects, but as David had mentioned, we're, um, we also have a core group of civil engineers, too. Um, so, uh, so next we have, I'm sorry, I'm so used to walking up to the screen. Uh, we have civil engineers, Frank Holmes and Sean Foster, and collectively they have about 30 years of experience uh, doing uh, sports fields as well. And then we also have some structural engineers on our team. Uh, we have electrical engineers, and then we also have um, permitting and wetlands um, scientists. And then, uh, so the only thing that we do not have in-house would be the, the surveying. 
and uh, which is you know, who we have on our proposal is someone that we use pretty much every single project too. So they're very familiar with, you know, it's 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 surveying a field that's not really too complicated because it's very open on, on this field especially too. So I think, um, but it, it's also valuable to to have the survey information. Um, this is just the aerial, obviously, um, and then we just kind of. We did some concepts. We kind of wanted to see some feasibility uh, of, of what you guys can actually get on those f the field right now. Um, <clears throat> when we did the site walk, we had mentioned uh, a couple different scenarios. And so this is one of the scenarios where we actually uh, put the track around the field and the uh, backstop fencing would have to actually move up about 13 feet or so so we can get enough room for that perimeter tr walking track around there. And, um, and then it also shows uh, sorry, I need to walk away for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, some bleachers, those would be portable bleachers, so only three row bleachers, so you can really, uh, you can pick them up, they're on wheels, so they're easily uh, movable instead of the five rows that are existing out there right now. And then also we showed some bleachers behind the backstop, the baseball backstop as well. I think that for a... Uh, oh, you can take the microphone out? That's what uh, he's saying. Oh, yeah, okay. He's saying, sorry. <laughs> you can take I the saw that. Out of the stairs <laughs> if you want to walk around. Okay. For a sort of recreational track of that facility, um, there are a, a bunch of different options. And in, 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 that's in, your, in your particular site, there are porous rubber options. And um, so we, we would walk you through all that, all the different options. I and mean, you definitely could put in sort of the, the traditional track option, asphalt pavement, rubber surfacing, you know, if you wanted um, a surface for the, the kids to, to, to train on so that they were on a similar surface as to when they were on a regulation track. Um, if you wanted to go sort of mo uh, more of a recreational route, there, like I said, there are paved in place um, rubber options. They're less expensive. I mean, we, could, we would do a quick cost analysis for you and the different levels of track surfacing, recreational surfacing. Being in the coastal wetland zone that you're in, um, the conservation um, uh, the Conservation Commission would, would maybe favor, you know, maybe a porous option. Um, Josh just, just did that on a, another project. Just to kind of speed it along. So enough time for questions also just wanted to show a uh, couple, <laughs> couple <laughs> images here of uh, similar projects that we just finished up this is the Fezzedin school this is in Newton Mass and this is right along a, uh, a riverfront so we, we're right on the river um, it's called the Cheesecake Brook but it's considered a riverfront <laughs> and what we had here was uh, similar it's a two-lane just walking <laughs> track it's not a regulation six-lane uh, running track it's actually just more for the community and then also for practice and uh, so that's two lanes. It's very similar to what you guys were requesting as well. And this is actually with porous pavement uh, and surfacing on there. And this is the, uh, the final product. There's, they still need to do the track surfacing w before this picture was taken. Um, but this is just kind of showing what it looks like. This is with a, uh, actually this is with an organic infill. This is the coconut um, infill. And then this is at Worcester Academy. This is very similar. This is a, a walking track that has, um, a couple metered, uh, every 100 meters there's a little bronze plaque in the pavement so you can kind of uh, meter your walking. And it's an informal kind of gesture as opposed to a really structured uh, running track. And then this is just uh, a couple examples of the baseball, uh, multi-purpose baseball. This is Haverhill. This is very similar to the layout that you guys have right now. This picture was taken from the stadium, so it's, uh, you know, almost exact replica of what you guys have with the, the stadium on the football side and then you have the dugout on the other the dugout and team areas on the on the back side over there and then um, this is St. Sebastian's and then that's Mystic Valley Regional Charter School so it's just kind of showing the multi-purpose uh, synthetic turf fields and this is a project that David worked on that he'll speak on so this is the, um, the ball fields at Battery Park City in, in uh, Lower Manhattan. Um, you can see overlapping soccer, um, baseball. I mean, most of the synthetic turf fields that we do, do these days, even if it's in sort of a stadium setting, it's going to get a lot of use. So we deal with sort of the multi-sport aspects. But this um, field was or organic when it originally went in as infill with the, with the safety pad underneath it. Um, and this was completely flooded by Hurricane Sandy. So um, was um, 
you know, the sewerage and the salt water and, you know, the subway system basically backed up, flooded the entire field. And, um, you know, the infill, um, you know, they, they, they can all float, all the different types available. Um, but the coconut can float, you know, is probably the, the most um, buoyant out of all the infills available. And this field um, has got a kind of a long story to the whole thing, but none of the infill went anywhere. Um, it's, it, it's critical the fiber type that you use in the field. Um, you, we we want to use um, at least some slit film fiber in the field. And once that gets uh, half a season to a season of play, it really starts to, to lock that infill in place. So, you know, if you've had a flood or, or, or any, any you know, major storm, uh, then, you know, that, that winter, if you got a season of play, it's really not going to go anywhere. It could be, could be inundated. So that's just a, a quick overview. We wanted to um, leave you plenty of time. This, this is really for, for questions. We have a whole series of slides here to maybe help answer some of your questions more, more quickly. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, first question, we, we have a, a set of pre-ordered questions. Uh, so since you have uh, submitted your whole proposal <coughs> in November, how many other jobs has your firm obtained and assigned the same, same key people during the projected time period of this project? I don't think we've given Josh another job for next year since we've submitted the proposal. Um, we are in the process, Josh is just finishing up bid documents for a project in Wilmington. Um, I'm finishing up um, uh, bid documents for a project at Northeastern University. Um, and we have a couple of other large projects that are kind of in construction. So we have not and this is really atypical for a lot of other fall, you know, seasons. We have not taken on a lot of work this fall because of our um, work through the winter that we had on the books. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, as you may know, the bonding authority for this proposed Hull Community Walking Track and Turf Field project was approved at a special town meeting uh, back in October uh, October 15th and 16th. Uh, the article uh, was brought forward through a citizen's petition and the school committee was not part of the planning or information gathering for the project. And as such, the school committee would like for the design firm to first you know, assess the current condition of the field, uh, consider the potential, the current and potential uses of the field and develop sort of a cost benefit analysis comparing a natural grass turf option with a synthetic turf option. So can you talk about your firm's experience with natural <coughs> grass turf fields and preparing uh, such a cost benefit analysis? Sure. Um, we, we get that question a lot just in terms of do you have something you can give us, you know, comparing the two. And we really try not to just hand something out because what kind of field construction do you have now? What, you know, when we talk about um, synthetic turf fields, there's a bunch of different options. When we talk about natural grass field construction, there's even more options. Um, you know, there's amending what you have out there. There's seeding it versus sodding it. There's bringing in a, um, um, you know, a new root zone. There's underdraining those fields. So depending on the level of performance, the expectations, um, you know, we want to talk through that natural grass system. And, and usually when mo once we do that, we're talking about amending what you have out there is one option. Bringing in a root zone and underdraining natural grass is another option, and then the third option is synthetic turf. So we have a lot of experience doing that, and then a lot of it just it, it, a lot of it comes down to maintenance expectations. You know, how much money are you going to put into maintaining it? If you're going to put into maintaining a natural grass field at a high level, you're going to spend a lot more money than you are on synthetic turf over a 10 to 20 year period. Um, you know, synthetic turf is not no maintenance. It needs, you know, uh, at least a couple of days a month of focused maintenance. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, now, what percentage of design work needs to be completed for you to be able to provide a reliable construction budget for us? Um, we're pretty good at, if we get in, do a really good program, understand once we have the geotechnical information and we do a, you know, a schematic a estimate at 30 percent, our estimates are pretty good. Uh, you know, uh, after that, the, the drivers are going to be, um, you know, changing program, really. And, 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 you know, it's putting a proper contingency on it just in case there's some site conditions or something that, you know, um, 
is unforeseen, you know, as we move through a design process. But we don't expect it to change drastically once, you know, we move into design development. Okay. Um, now, as you may be aware, the bonding authority for this project uh, passed, but it is contingent on the passage of a debt exclusion, which will be coming up at town elections, uh, likely to be held May 16th. What exclusion was it? Uh, a debt exclusion. This kind of the way that this will be financed. We, we, the special town meeting approved the bonding authority, but gotcha. sort of the final um, approval to go ahead. Approval if you will, will be in May. Now, the funding for the design services is immediately available from a different source, so uh, we have funding <laughs> for that. Um, however, as you might imagine, some people in the community have suggested that we wait until the debt exclusion passes before proceeding with planning for this project. Now, do you have any thoughts about um, balancing the need to perform sort of due diligence on a project like this? Um, with the desire not to waste money in the event of a debt exclusion fails and sort of is there an optimal percentage of design work that would sort of answer everyone's questions without really getting ahead of the process yeah I mean if you're if you're still considering natural grass versus synthetic turf if we moved into that 30 percent design it certainly wouldn't be a, a waste of time and you know the pheasant in project we started five years ago you know, and, and the cost, you know, so if we do planning to a certain level and you decide not to continue, I think it's valuable. The high school isn't going anywhere. You know, I, I think it's value. It's, it's only going to cost more in the future. Um, but, you know, we're willing to work with you if you, you know, if we take it to sort of 20%, we sit down, we say, here are the parameters, here's the cost, here's what, here's how many weeks. You know, a lot of times when clients want to stall on the design, it's like, well, okay, if we give you the go ahead, how many weeks does it take to, finish it and bid it and build it so you know a lot of times we end up working backwards and forwards on different scheduling scenarios you know to help you make decisions so okay. we'll work with you to make a decision on that <coughs> all right okay. thank you I think some other members will ask questions so i have um, i have the next question if the debt exclusion does not pass there's a likelihood that construction will not happen on the rfp schedule uh, how has your firm handled this situation in the past how long are the design plans uh, good for as far as like if they sit on the shelf yeah. uh, how long are they good for are they good for five years two years and they need to be updated so the conservation commission approval is usually good for three years and can be extended uh, prior to that deadline you can get an extension um, so you know again we'll work very closely with you if, if we get to sort of a hundred percent cds and don't bid the project mm -hmm. I mean, generally, they're, they're good unless anything changes out, out there. You know, if other things are built or something else changes, I mean, I would think the plans would be. And, and, and then if technology changes, you know, we may want to revisit the spec in terms of the turf system or some infill might be available in two or three years. It's not available now. You know, so I think there's a, there's a startup start factor, you know, to go back to the plans. And, but, you, you know, we keep our, our CA dollars would not we would not get into that so you know you would you'll see a break you know the breakdown and that's in the proposal for construction admin or things like that I mean we'll work very closely with you to, to make the project work for you okay very good thanks come up next um, please explain the pros and cons of using different types of infill materials under a synthetic turf field playing surface Please describe your firm's experience working with different types of infill materials. I know you did touch on it briefly. What is the track record for the more conventional infill products, such as crumb rubber, compared to alternative infill products? How can you ensure this field surface will be safe for athletic play and reach or exceed its expected useful life? And last but not least, what are the cost differences between the different types of infill products? Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll I can repeat a question if you. Yeah. We'll, we'll the first one was, yeah. We'll, Go ahead. we'll try to cover all those, but I'm glad you asked the question. You, you guys you mentioned safety in yep. that scenario because one of the things that we want to do is we want to talk about the system first you know the 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 most of the cost of the project everybody thinks about the turf you know most of the cost of the project if, if you don't have good soil that's where the most of the cost is going to be improving that um, base condition to build a to build a field on to put that investment on if the turf turf costs three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and the drainage base cost three hundred thousand dollars we want to make sure that we've got a really good you, you know um, sub grade to build that field on and so just very quickly Josh you know uh, we want to address drainage um, we want to address um, like I said subsoil conditions but 
in order to address safety and playability of the field, we want the field to be as much, if, if it's synthetic turf, we want it to act as much like natural grass as possible. And the only way to get that performance underfoot, but to provide that shock attenuation is what we call it, that safety factor when you fall on the field, is to have a safety pad underneath it. Um, we cannot keep a field um, soft enough isn't the right word, but we can't keep that safety factor, and we'll get into this with you, the GMAX levels of that field. Um, they need to be below 100. And if we went out and tested, pick any dozen, three dozen, pick any synthetic turf field that doesn't have a safety pad on it, it's going to be above 100 in its GMAX level. So we need a safety pad below that field. Um, that's going to cut down a little bit on the, the turf system cost, um, but not enough to make up for the cost of the pad. So the, the cost of the system on the right is more expensive than the system on the left. The system has no safety pad. It just relies on that crumb rubber and sand whether it be crumb rubber or coconut or TPE, you know, virgin rubber, it's only relying on that for safety. We want a consistent level of safety below that field. So if the infill moves around, we want the minimum level of safety below that field. And going into infill. Going back to uh, having that safety pad is also good as, um, you know, if you don't maintain the field as much as you like. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't maintain the field as much as you'd like to, uh, say if you, you don't do it, you know, three times a month, uh, and you only get to it maybe once a month or once every six months, some clients even do maybe once a year or more than that. Um, if you don't maintain it, you lose a lot of infill through migration in, you know, someone's cleats or socks or, you know, pockets or anything like that. So you start losing a lot of infill. And when you don't have that infill, you don't have the, the same... Um, safety harness, I, sh I don't, I don't want to say that, but uh, basically the, um, the resilient underlayment, that white pad that's underneath, is basically an insurance policy for you because you can insure yourself that you know down the road if you don't maintain it to the full capability of the turf, you're going to end up having um, you know, a field that still has a, a, a safety um, boundary where it should be specified where it was specified when it was originally installed. So, so you know, th th that minimum level of safety. And that pad will last uh, three carpet replacements as well. So the next time you replace the carpet, um, you, you're not going to replace that safety pad. How long um, does a carpet last? I don't depending on the level of play, it's a function of uh, UV exposure and, and hours of play. Um, you should, ex you know, the, the, the warranty is eight years. Um, you should expect eight to 12 years. That's another thing, you know, um, being involved in the industry, knowing where the fiber is coming from. You know, um, the, a lot of the turf manufacturers have gotten into making their own fiber. Um, but the proven, the high quality, really durable, proven fiber is from a, a, a very small number of fiber manufacturers. That, that's all they do is make fiber. Um, so we have a fields that have been down for 10, 12 years right now. And so we actually look back. We don't look at the sort of latest and greatest fiber available. We look at the proven uh, in the field fiber. Um, so we're not just, you know, <coughs> telling you to buy from vendor X or vendor Y, we're specifying the fiber, the backing, the infill, the pad, to get really the best system for your facility. And then get it bid and get some competition on that, on that pricing. So just to address infill really quickly, um, this is actually the scariest slide out in the industry right now, because you can call a number of vendors, and they'll send this to you. They'll send you all these options. But ask them the question, well, how long has that one been in the ground? Which one is proven? You know, which one's really reliable? So there's several products up here that have only been on the market for a year. Um, we have extensive experience with crumb rubber is up on the right. You know, that's what's been used. Crumb rubber and sand has been used for 20 years in infill. Um, coated rubber has been used more recently. It has a color coating on it. Um, it's the same rubber, just, just coated with, a, um, with either a, a green or brown. Um, we like it for several reasons. It's, just, it's a lot cleaner. 
Yeah, um, so going back to the SBR rubber uh, for cost, one of your part of your question was cost. Um, it does kind of range, SBR is going to be the cheapest and significantly cheaper than any other turf um, by, I mean, any other infill uh, by, you know, say a dollar or two, but that's per square foot. So if your field is 100,000 square feet, it's $100,000 right there of a difference for just the infill. Um, crumb rubber, um, you know, the, the based on, depends on what the manufacturer provides for the cost, but we estimate about, uh, you know, it can range between 60 to 85 cents square foot. That's crumb rubber. So then we got the mixture of silica sand as well, so then you have to add in that, that price, which isn't, isn't too, um, you know, doesn't vary too much. But then we have the coated SBR rubber, uh, which is an acrylic. Um, coating over the rubber, which kind of encapsulates. Um, it lowers the VOCs by about 75 percent, and um, and this is a infill that we just pre we just used at Harvard Stadium. The coach, not, this wasn't anything to do with any of the health concerns, but the coach wanted uh, a, f uh, a field that filmed um, in HD uh, a lot better than you you see like you know if, if you ever watch a Toronto <laughs> Blue Jeans yeah he wanted green infill um, yeah. and this promotes itself as saying it's it's it films uh, great and so we put that in and um, it actually does uh, compared to other fields that we've seen uh, surprisingly it does make a difference the, just having the green infill in there um, and then we have the EDP, EPDM rubber which is the ethylene poly uh, propylene sorry ethylene propylene diene um, and that's a uh, virgin rubber, and that can cost. That's very expensive. That's that's um, it's got basically the same feel as SBR rubber, the um, typical crumb rubber, but it's uh, it's a virgin and it's it's flat. It's probably about three dollars and fifty cents to five dollars and eighty cents square foot. So that's that's the most expensive infill that's out there. <coughs> Just. EPDM was on the market years ago. They had a bunch of, uh, of stabilization problems with it, so it went off the market. And depending on the manufacturer, there's only one manufacturer that we would trust to do EPDM on your, on your project. And they may, the same manufacturer is a German company called Milos, they make a very high quality TPE. Um, and it, they're both expensive, but theoretically EPDM should be less expensive. But for some reason we're not seeing the price come, we're not seeing EDPM for, for a less expensive price because it's a lot less expensive to manufacture than the TPE. But we think with the issue, you know, pe people's concerns, the <coughs> prices, prices are staying up there. What's the threshold somebody's willing to pay for an alternative? That's what it comes down to. And then uh, David had mentioned TPE, so that's the next image down here. That's a thermoplastic elastomer, and it's similar to rubber. Uh, don't want to bore you guys too much and get into the details, but it's uh, it's about uh, half the price as the uh, EDPM or e EPDM, um, and then kind of skipping around. This is Nike Grind. This is uh, post-consumer uh, recycled shoes. The problem with this is it hasn't been tested, so we don't know anything about uh, if it has any um, fallbacks like the SBR uh, stipulation. Uh, that's been going around right now in the news, and I think Dave can talk about the SBR um, safety-wise um, just briefly. I think we can get into it in a future meeting. Well, and just to talk to our experience, so I mean, 90 per 90 percent of our projects have been SBR rubber and sand. We do have experience with uh, the next level of experience. I would say the TPE. We have um, um, about uh, eight or nine. TPE fields that we've done, um, and we have um, four um, organic coconut and cork specifically um, products. We we like the coconut um, cork combination better than the all co better than the all um, cork combination. Um, how long has that been around the coconut and cork? This how much is well? how long has it been around? It has actually been around. So in 2010, um, I went to uh, Europe to find the oldest coconut infill field we could find. At that time, it was six years old. And they were um, having drainage problems with the infill. You know, the organic was breaking down. 
<coughs> but they had a what we call a full infill system. So it was uh, an inch and three quarters of infill. And y you know, you get coconut mat that's breaking down and the drainage rate is going to slow down. We came up with a system for, for Battery Park City that had a safety pad, had a lot of sand, and had the organic infill. So as it breaks down, it will slow down, but because the mat is not as thick, it will last longer. Um, we, you know, basically we want it to last the life of the carpet. We estimate that carpet of 10 to 12 years as a high, very high quality fiber, you know, plastic fiber in it. Um, but you do have to test the cork. We, if you told us you want an organic infill field, we have to decide on the supplier and we have to test that cork. There's um, arsenic in some of the supplies of, of, cor of uh, cork because of the coconut trees are in India, Malaysia, and it's not so much you know, it's either the fertilization of those trees or it's cleaning the factory where they husked the coconuts. Um, as Josh said, the Nike grind, you go ask Nike what's in Nike grind. You know, all that EPDM rubber is made in China, Malaysia. Um, they don't really want to get into to testing it and open themselves up. Okay. But, you know, we can tell you, we can give you all the studies on chrome rubber. I mean, it goes 50-50 right now. We, our clients that are concerned about it, we give them all the test data. We'll test the crumb rubber. We'll show that it passes the yes. EN71 test, which is the European norm test, norm test for child's toys. Basically says if you pass this test, you can use the product in a child's toy. So, and there's um, just a couple of recent articles that came out, I mean, PhDs and doctors that looked at the material can't find any link between what's in crumb rubber and cancer. Um, so we give you all that, help you make a decision, let you make an edu educated decision on how you want to move, move forward. Are there any questions? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was know, good. More. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Nope, I think that's So we, we've, just, to, just to, to kind of close out the slide here, we've, we've stayed away from kind of the coated sand, the coated materials. I mean, the coatings are going to wear off under right. play. Um, and the zeolite is a, like a diatomaceous earth product that, you know, is great for a dog park or something like that, but we don't think it's, we think it's going to wear the fiber in a, in a high performance application. Yeah. So just so the, the crumb rubber is about a dollar, and then you move over to the Epsom yeah, rubber, I mean and that's about 350 to 580. So that, yeah. and then what about the organic coconut husk and how much? Well, organic and TPE are about the same. Um, they're a little, they're in between the SPR and the Okay. No, 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 that's fine. Yeah. I was just trying to see. Okay. Depending on the size of the field, the system, you're talking anywhere from 150000 to $250,000 additional. Right. To change it out. Okay. Thank you. I'm next. Um, thank you guys for doing this publicly. We appreciate that. Um, my question is the Hull School Committee and the Hull community would like a turf field and walking track that will last as long as reasonably possible. I would like it to last forever. <laughs> That's not reasonable. <laughs> but uh, what length warranties are available for the products that you would likely recommend for this type of project? So the the turf, as I mentioned earlier, is is the industry standard is an eight year warranty. Um, there is one manufacturer that's toyed around with like a ten or twelve year warranty. You pay for that. Okay. And you pay additional for that. And the reason they're doing that is that they're um, using one of the same fibers that we, we will put in the specification. It's the most durable synthetic turf plastic fiber that we, that we know of. Um, we can point you to some examples. Um, so, you know, getting a high quality fiber in the system is where the first place to start. Um, and I think the track surfacing, um, you know, I think may potentially looking at um, more of a recreational product than an actual track performance product, <coughs> will, they will last longer for this application. So looking at all the individual components and you know, what's gonna be, what's gonna be more durable, what's gonna do better in the fog, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and in the moist conditions um, and um, you know, kind of make sure everything is of, a, of a equal quality. Okay, you had, you had mentioned that um, we could expect to have the field last probably 10 to 12 years. Is that dependent on what the infill is going to be? No, it's it's more about the level of play, really, that you put out there on it. Yeah. Okay. So where if you get uh, all-season play, like if you, if you plow, 
<laughs> if, if you get all season play, if you plow the fields, uh, you're obviously going to get a lot more use out of it. Uh, I know here you guys have uh, lacrosse, field hockey, soccer, baseball, football. So I mean that that's a lot of use for one field. Um, <clears throat> so I think uh, you know you just want to make sure that the warranty is 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 what you guys want, and um, and. Right, and the manufacturer, and you get a reputable manufacturer that will stand behind it. Um, and then that, kind of going back to, uh, don't want to get too much into infill, but uh, with organic, you do need to replenish that field and top it off, is what we call it. And that's probably uh, three to four super sacks, which very large white sacks you see um, around maybe at Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, but that, that's about once a year, three to four um, applications of that on top of the original application of the infill. Okay, good to know. So it, it does require a little bit more maintenance than the other infill products. Okay, thank you. The field playing, so, the field playing surface will continue to be used by various sports, such as baseball, field hockey, soccer, lacrosse. How do you determine the height of the grass for this multi-purpose field? Does the height of the grass have any effect on the warranty? Um, no to the last part of the question, it doesn't have an effect on the warranty. Um, but, you know, where we start, I mean, you, you put out in your RFP what the sports are, but that's the first thing that we go over with you is the program for the field. Um, we've done several um, multi-purpose surfaces. If field hockey is a priority sport, so we, we rank the sports. Um, you know, even though it's a multi-purpose surface, what are the games that are going to happen out there? Um, you know, is, is it going to be a field hockey game, soccer games? Um, those, those sports, the ball is in co direct contact with the surface, relying on the surface. Um, and so with field hockey, if it, depending on what level of field hockey we're talking about, we want to speed the ball up versus slow the ball down. Soccer, we want to slow the ball down, typically with synthetic turf. Um, again, mimicking natural grass, we want the soccer ball and the, in the, in the synthetic turf fiber to interact like they would on a natural grass situation. But field hockey players want to speed the ball up. So we'll talk about what that exposed fiber height will be. We've done several fields that are geared towards field hockey. We fill them up a little bit higher. But in this case, if we put a safety pad in, um, we will actually, we can actually bring the um, fiber height down. And so we're not paying for more infill. So this is, this is where the, the safety pad really begins to pay for itself because now if we're talking about an alternative infills, we're talking about less alternative infills because we have a safety pad and, we're and we have to, and depending on the, the, um, the height, the sport, the exposed pile, what's the ratio of sand? So we can firm something up by putting more sand in it, but if we want to keep it safe and bring the pile height down to save money, we, we may not increase the, the sand ratio. So it's just, We'll go through this <laughs> whole matrix. What are the sports? What's important? What are the options? And um, come back with recommendations for, for pile height to, based on the infill. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the original schedule as specified in the RFP was intended to see if the project could reasonably be completed for the fall 2016 season and maintain the high level and quality both the owner and designer would expect from this project. Would you recommend any changes to the schedule at this point? If so, what is the benefit of such change and what would be the impact on the price of the project? So we would like to get the schematic plan approved as quickly as possible, get into the technical documents that we need to to get the permitting done. Um, you know, we want to bid the project as, as quickly as possible because we will be bidding other projects in January for, for start of construction in May or June. You know, June, July, and August are all the high school projects, <laughs> all the fields going in. So all the turf vendors, the turf vendors will come in here and say, we've never been late on a project before, bull. Um, <laughs> you know, they're all trying to get the fields done for August 15th or September 1st. So, you know, we want to really try to work around those dates. You know, if there was any way to break ground in May, we would want to do that, try and get turf down in July or, or you know, hey, the kids aren't going to be happy about it, the coaches aren't going to be happy about it, but you're th you'll get a higher quality field if we go for a late September installation. Okay. You know, um, it's so if we went with the fall, we'd probably save some money if we waited or not? Y you probably will. If, if we can, and, and if we can't bid it in January to get a good price, we end up um, 
bidding it later in the spring and the contractors know it's a fall construction, they'll give you a better price. They like, they want a price, they can, they can, they can build a field in September, October, November, get the turf down, and that's the f nice fall project for them. Okay. Same guys that, you know, because the base guys finish up a, ba a project at August 1st and hand it over to the turf guys. So July, if they can jump on a project, you know, in September, that's, you get a better price. Okay, good. Oh, me. Um, as indicated in the central register posting in the RFP, there is a not to exceed budget for this project of $100,000. Will all invoices submitted related to this project not exceed the project budget? Well, I don't think they can, but if no, what are the additional expenses and the additional costs? Typically, on a project like this, it's the permitting requirements. You know, we can't dictate if the Conservation Commission is going to come back with you know, uh, changes or desires or wants, and we're going to have to come to you guys with, you know, um, different changes to the drainage design or, you know, especially with the town project. I mean, before we get into those details, we're going to go sit down with the Conservation Commission. We're going to try to avoid any of those surprises. But it's typically around the permitting. Or if you, you, you want to add something to the project that's, you know, unforeseen, changes the design. Um, if we can agree on the program and agree on the concept, I don't see any changes. What other perm so this CONCOM, is there any other permitting that goes, that has to go through or is that really? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No, that's all right. <laughs> is there, a, wh what other agencies would you have to go in front of besides CONCOM? Would there be anything else, do you think, or? Sorry, I wasn't going to answer your question. Oh. I was, I was oh. mention, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <coughs> now, I'm thinking of, now I'm thinking of your question. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I just wasn't sure since you said the permitting well, was the biggest variable. I wasn't sure if there was anything else that. That's the, you know, maybe a coastal zone review, but not a, not really a permit. Okay. More of a review. That's fine. And there's um. um there would be a, a NIPTES um, notification. That's uh, because we'd be uh, clearing more than an acre. Again, it's not a permit, it's a federal notification. Okay. You have to get like a uh, building permit or is that part of the conservation process? It, there will be a building permit for the, you, typically for the electrical mm -hmm. system, yep. for the lighting. Typically the field doesn't require one. Okay, so just for electrical problem. Okay. okay. Thanks. See you again. Uh, sometimes the owner does not have the information you are seeking. Please give an example or two of how you have handled the situation that has kept the project on schedule and on budget and maintained overall value of the work performed for the owner. Um, I guess the, um, you know, a lot of times we've um, started a project, we don't have the geotechnical information, things like that. Um, and just knowing what we knowing what we can do that won't be affected by the changes in that information once we get it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we might take the electrical component further along than the base design component because we don't have that information. Or um, sometimes with different user, you know, with a lot of different user groups and a lot of different input, um, you know, not completing that component until we have all the input or you have made a decision on infill and things like that. Um, so it's really just knowing what knowing what we can efficiently move forward on and don't have to backtrack on. Short answer questions for the proposed project manager. So, how many years have you been project manager for outdoor athletic facilities? Uh, well, I've been with the company for 10 years. As a project manager, five years. How many projects have you completed in your time? Completed? Mm -hmm. Um, <coughs> well, I s as a project manager or from yeah. when I started as a d designer? Project manager. Um, project manager, I probably do um, three, two to three a, 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 a year, a summer. How many of those projects did you receive an award for? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> probably mm -hmm. uh, at least 80%, 90%. Um, that one project, I, I, uh, the Worcester Academy, uh, we received Facility of the Year for that. That was the uh, American Sports Builders, Builders Association uh, two years ago. It was 2000, or 2012, sorry. And um, that was a really interesting project. I thought it was, it, was, it was really cool, and we ended up getting that award. And it was a national award, so it's, it's pretty interesting. Exciting. 
Mystic Valley, yeah, Mist, uh, Mystic Valley Regional Charter School, we, we got single field uh, award on that. Um, if, if you look on our proposal, you'll be able to see the list of awards that we've gotten recently, too. So uh, for each person, for me, for, for David, for Sean, and, and the other people that have worked on the projects with us. Great. Um, do you hold an MCPPO certification for designers? No. It's like a bidding. You guys, do you guys do the bidding and stuff like that? Like that? We, we do. We, have, we, just, we don't have that certification. Others right. in our firm do. Um, we, um, we will give, you know, we can give them the documents. We do a lot of peer review. Mm -hmm. We are ISO um, certified. Mm -hmm. Santec is as a company. So we have to have a quality control <coughs> and review process that's documented. So if you wanted that to help review, mm -hmm. the, the person reviewing it, we did that to make sure they're certified. Yep. Okay. Oh, my question. You're up. Sorry about that. <laughs> got sidetracked. Uh, in your review as project manager for an athletic field or track, please share with us the worst and best experience both you and an owner had on the job. What did you learn that you can apply to make sure that a similar situation does not arise in Hull? <laughs> uh, it's always a learning experience uh, every, every time you do a design because uh, you never know what's what's going to happen. There's always some uh, unforeseen uh, happenings that that end up popping up here and there. Um, you've seen any H D uh, HGTV show and, and you'll see, you know, <laughs> Property Brothers, you know, they'll say there's always an issue, you know, and, and we try to work around that. We try to plan ahead of, uh, you know, get ahead of the curve on that. Um, we're really diligent on, on all the, um, all our drawings and everything and we have the experience um, to be able to know what, what our previous issues were. Um, so for like a track and field, um, you want to make sure that the um, that the bituminous concrete underneath, um, not necessarily saying this is going to be the same system as a, a typical track, but you want to make sure that it's free of oil, debris, anything like that. You know, you want to you want to make sure the contractor is on top of the tolerances too, because sometimes they'll have a paving contractor come out here, and um, they'll just be used to paving highways and. And they'd be really good at paving highways, but when you get down to a track, you need to have a certain uh, tolerance. And and uh, so, you know, we're very we're out during the construction administration. We'll be out there. Um, you'll see me out there basically doing push-ups when we're doing the f not actually doing push-ups, <laughs> but I'm on the field laying down, looking, making sure the field and the track are to the tolerances that we expect. And and I'm all over the field, everywhere. You know, I'm not just in one spot. I'll be. I got a good workout that day. So. <laughs> Do you anticipate any kind of, uh, like, what, what would probably be the biggest um, hurdle that we would have to uh, surpass, probably the CONCOM? Yeah, I think permitting is, is always the biggest hurdle, uh, absolutely. Um, so the, the, the latest and greatest lesson learned, um, on not uh, fortunately for us, not directly by our group, but somebody who joined Stantec recently, um, did some tennis courts, and they had, um, iron in the aggregate that was used in the asphalt base. And that spalled through the, um, the surfacing. So you get all this streaking on you know, tennis courts that are two years old. And um, you know, we, found, um, we found language in several recently published bituminous specifications that addressed exactly that issue. And so it's really, Due diligence, again, on every single component. I mean, this is back to the stone that's used in the aggregate of the asphalt um, to make sure they're not having that issue and to make sure the plant's aware of, of where the aggregate's coming from and mixing the asphalt and so on. So yeah. make sure you're, just say, make sure you're geotech. It, yeah, the geotech I information and geotechs we find um, it's actually counterintuitive. They over-design for athletic fields because if you don't have somebody who's experienced doing fields, they're used to doing buildings, heavy roadway construction. They're not used to, um, you know, building athletic fields. So to be cost-effective, we don't want to over-design. We want to design appropriately. Next. Uh, you kind of touched on a couple of these, but this will firm up some answers. Once the construction begins, who can we expect to see on the job site on a daily basis? That's what I thought. I wouldn't be daily. Uh, well. Okay. Um, 
What do you say? How, it won't be daily, but once a week at least. How often can we expect to see the project manager on the job site? <laughs> Just answer that. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Nope, that's fine. At and least once a week. How frequently will contractor submittals be reviewed and recommended for payment by your firm on this job? Every time. Every submittal will go through us. Every uh, AIA document for the uh, payment apps will be going through us. We review. Right, yeah. yeah. For the payment app is, is right. yeah, monthly. Yep. But no, I know what that is. Thank you. Yep. Okay. How will you... How will your firm make sure all of the an all of the annual and seasonal preventative maintenance tasks that the manufacturer recommends for the equipment and systems in the project get communicated to the owner? Yep. Well, we have uh, since we're so ingrained in the industry, we have a lot of good relationships with all uh, the major uh, turf manufacturers, infill providers. Um, so we see them. They come into our office pretty often to to you know let us know what their latest product is, but we also meet at conventions and, and conferences as well. Um, so we all have very good relationships with them. So they wouldn't want to ruin a relationship with a designer because we're the ones that are, you know, allowing them, right. approving their product. Right. So uh, we stay on top of them for sure okay. uh, during the warranty period. Um, and and they, for the most part, they are, you know, very responsive for the ones that we work with. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. And uh, for this, yeah, for the specifications, a lot of times in the turf specifications, we'll include uh, maybe a, a year of maintenance uh, required from the turf manufacturer to come in. So you guys don't have to worry about it. Okay. Ooh, and then um, from then on, they'll kind of hook you up with, you know, how to maintain the field. Um, we'll also include the grooming equipment in the spec and, uh, and what you would need for that, too. Depending on how much maintenance you want, as part of the project. Um, like Josh said, we can build in a year. Some clients say, give us eight years. Build it all in during the warranty period. But what we like about the one year is if you're assuming that um, you know town, town is gonna take over maintenance, they really should do it together for the first year. So it's not just a one time, an hour out on site, getting a little bit of training and they're mm -hmm. gone. You know, um, Like Josh said, that's the other thing, is, is knowing them, we can get them back here if you need them back here, right. you know, things like that. Great. Great. <laughs> oh, my turn. At this point, do you have any questions for us? Um, I don't think so. Not that I can think of right now. Um, I don't know that we have any direct questions. I mean, we'd love to sit down with you. We we. Um, we understand, you know, what you put out in the RFP, um, and we put a few things like turf review, uh, infill review. Um, you know, we put a few things in there as part of our standard process. Um, so, you know, we'd love the opportunity to sit down and really um, go over the scope of work, go over the project plan. You know, uh, make sure that. Um, you know, basically add what, what we think you need, but hear from you as well as to, you know, come up with a plan that's going to make this a successful project for the, for the town hall. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, if, if you'd like to make a short closing statement uh, to, start to wrap it up. Um, you know, we don't, um, we, we don't take on a lot of work. We take on the work that we can focus on and you asked a question sort of to that effect, which I, I appreciate the question. Um, we and, we and we have a, a mix of public and private work too. We don't we don't go after every RFP that, that comes out. Um, I love the fact that you know what we do for Harvard actually translates into valuable information for town, cities and towns. Um, when I mentioned going over to Europe and doing research on infill, uh, coconut infill, I mean that was for Harvard. We actually paid for it on our dime because of the work we do for them. But now, over the last you know, five years, I've been able to share that information with you know all of our clients. Um, so, and again, I think being heavily involved in, in the industry, um, you know, a lot of personal time on our parts has been spent. And you know that's why we're here on a, on a Monday night, <laughs> so we can share that information with you. So we'd love the opportunity to do that. Thank you very much. You know, I think that it's not just the project manager, too, just to further on your question. I mean, I work very closely with Josh. You know, anytime you're in Boston, stop by our office, and it's very much a team working together. 
Um, you'll see Sean out here, um, who was the production manager. So he's he's in charge of keeping the drawings on track. You know, keep, keep producing the, the drawings that that you know get bid ultimately. He works very closely with Josh, very closely with me. He'll be out here to understand the site, so he understands what he's in charge of. Um, but we're a team, um, and you know, if Josh can't be here, I'll be here, or Sean will be here. So. Thank you for having us. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Great. All right. I think uh, at this point we'll take uh, another short recess just to get to the next one.